The scary stories will start in 25 seconds. Before they do, I just want to remind you to subscribe to my channel if you enjoy my videos. I am dedicated to making quality content for you, always with minimal ads. So again, if you enjoy my videos, please subscribe and hit the thumbs up. It really does help my channel so much. Now, let's begin. One time, I went to the bar with one of my friends. I had just turned 21, so I haven't been to many bars up to that point. My friend was drinking on the way to the bar, so he was already pretty drunk when we got there. When I sat at the bar, a cute girl came and talked to me and my friend. She said her name was Candace, and I noticed she had really, really bright red hair. I assumed that she dyed it. It was pretty, but unnatural. This girl was flirting with me and my friend. She could tell my friend was already very drunk. To be honest, I played along like I was drunk already too, since it seemed to be working for my friend. I didn't know if she was just trying to get free drinks, so I told her we didn't have any money. She offered to buy us drinks. She kept buying us drinks, and I started to get confused as to who she liked between me and my friend. My friend went to the bathroom. Before he came back, he was kicked out by the bouncers. He was too drunk. Candace and I went outside with him. She kept telling him to go home with her. He was so out of it he could barely answer her. I told her he was too drunk and that I couldn't let him go anywhere. I didn't want him to wake up hungover in some random house with no car and no idea what happened. Candace kept pushing it, saying that she would take care of him, but I told her no because I had to stay with him. I was more sober and he was my responsibility. I told her the only way he was going anywhere was if I tagged along. I assumed she thought I was jealous or cock-blocking him, but my friend could barely stand and lost interest in Candace already at that point. She immediately started flirting with me and offered to get my friend a taxi to drive him home and said that we could go to her place alone. At this point, I had a few drinks and I was pretty buzzed, so I agreed. We took my friend to the taxi and walked to her car. I slightly stumbled on the way to her car. Wow, you're pretty drunk, huh? She said, smiling, as she held onto my arm. Yeah, I said. I don't know why, but I just felt slightly shy and anxious. Everything was just happening too easy for me, so I felt uneasy. We got in her car, and we drove down the street. Want to stop at the liquor store and get more to drink? I'll buy, so don't worry about paying, she offered. I didn't want to drink any more than I already did. I was already buzzed and wanted to be able to carry myself throughout the rest of the night. Sometimes I made myself look stupid when I'm drunk, so I didn't want to ruin anything with Candace more than I already did earlier with telling her my friend was too drunk. I told her I was already drunk enough, but she insisted. I didn't want to seem lame, so I told her to get me a pint of liquor with some apple juice to chase it. She went in the store and came out with a lot more than just a pint. I assumed she wanted to drink more also, and that's why she got a fifth instead of a pint. On the car ride, we passed the bottle back and forth, but she took tiny sips. I tried to take tiny sips, but she kept passing me the bottle and telling me to drink. I somehow managed to drink all of my apple juice and pretended to drink the bottle by spitting the liquor in the apple juice bottle. I tossed the apple juice bottle full of liquor out the window before she saw it. I took a couple more sips of liquor and finished the bottle. Throughout the car ride, I called her the wrong name a couple of times to get a reaction out of her. She did not react to it. She just kept letting me call her Carla without correcting me. For some reason, I thought she lied to me about her name initially. We drove up to her house. I pretended to trip and stumble into her front door. She helped me walk inside by holding me up. 
She opened her front door, which was unlocked, and we walked in her house. She closed her front door, and then locked it. I thought that was strange, but assumed that she didn't want anyone walking in on us. I told her that I had to use the bathroom. I walked into her bathroom, locked the door, and looked in the mirror. I just felt strange. I felt like something was off. I felt myself becoming more drunk from finishing the bottle earlier. I turned on the sink to make noise and made myself puke up the liquor I drank. I flushed and went to the sink and started drinking the tap water out of my hands to try and sober up. I just didn't want to be drunk, but I still wanted to hook up with Candace, so I wanted to pretend to be drunk. I turned the sink off and could hear her talking to someone. He's drunk as hell. He can barely stand up. You do it. Who was she talking to? And do what? I walked out of the bathroom into the living room. The moment I stepped into the living room, I saw her walking into another room. All I could see was the back of her head. That strange, very bright red hair go into another room. I didn't see her face or anything. I just saw her kind of walk fast into the room. The living room was pretty dark. Hey, where, where are you going? I slurred like I was drunk. She walked back into the dark living room and up to me. Let's go in my room, she said. I looked at her bright red hair and then into her eyes. They were different. Her face was different. It was another girl with the same hair. That's when I realized it was another girl with the same wig on. It was a wig the whole time. She had changed it with the girl from earlier for whatever reason. My heart felt like it stopped, but I tried to look like I had no idea that it was a different girl. I kind of smiled at her and told her I just needed to use the bathroom one more time and told her sorry that I was just so drunk. She said, It's fine, just hurry up in there. I went into the bathroom and locked the door. I heard her whisper something to someone again. This time, I think I heard a male voice whisper back. I honestly didn't concentrate on listening to exactly what she said. Something sketchy was going on, and I had to get out of that house. I opened the bathroom window and jumped straight out of it and ran faster than I ever have in my life. I didn't look behind myself or anything. I just ran through the backyard, jumped the fence, ran through someone else's backyard, hit a road, and ran towards the main road. I kept running down the main road until I saw a CVS store. I ran inside and stood straight at the front of the store, in front of the camera. I called a taxi and went home. I try to think what happened that night. What was she, or they, planning? Why did she tell me a fake name? Why was she trying to get my friend and I so drunk? I thought maybe a robbery, but she kept spending money on us. She kept buying us drinks, and even paid for my friend's taxi. And mostly, why did she wear a wig that she gave to another girl to wear? Who was that girl? Who was she talking to? What did it mean? And what was in the room that they tried to lure me into? I guess I'll never know. Needless to say, I doubt anything as scary will ever happen to me again. Two years ago, right around Halloween, I was babysitting for these two ladies who each had a son. They wanted to go out, so I stayed at one of their houses and watched their boys. It was around 8 p.m. and the boys were sitting on the couch playing on their iPads and whatnot, when somebody knocked on the door. I asked them if anybody was supposed to come over, and they both said no. I go over and check the eye hole in the door and it's some guy in a gray hoodie, deliberately hunched over so I can't see his face. Immediately, I said to myself, Nope, 
and didn't say anything and began pacing around because I don't want to give up any inclination that we are inside. A couple minutes later I check outside the little window through the curtains and he's gone. I didn't want to spook the kids and there weren't any more knocks so I just kind of let it go. Cut to a few hours later and the moms get back home. They ask me how everything was and I say the kids were great but that somebody had come to the door. They asked me what time, and I said around 8 p.m., and one of the moms started freaking out and going through her phone. The other one tells me that right around that time, somebody had been making strange phone calls to them on a blocked number. They had disguised their voice and were saying things like, I can see you through your window. They didn't think it was serious because it didn't make sense in the context of where they were, but in retrospect, we're almost positive it was me that he was looking at through the window. They escorted me to my car, and I touched base later, and apparently, nothing strange ever happened after that. But I'm just really glad I did not open that door, because I have a feeling in my gut, something very bad would have happened. This happened in the summer of 2010, when I was just entering my teenage years. My family took a trip to a really nice hotel in the city. I can't really remember why we decided to take the trip, but I remember a lot of family friends coming with and staying in adjacent rooms. I've never asked my parents, and it's not really important to the story. To preface, I'm a bit of a scaredy cat, and always have been. I'm a pretty skinny, fragile kid, so I get spooked pretty easily, even now. This, however, was almost definitely not me freaking myself out like I normally did. Looking back, I'm incredibly lucky I trusted my instincts. This hotel had a strange design to it. The lobby was actually on the fourth floor, not the bottom floor, which I found very strange. To access the lobby, you had to use the elevator. There was no way for you to get to it from the stairs. This information would have been nice before everything happened, as you'll find out. The hotel was organized in a square shape. Every floor was lined with a balcony, and you could look down into the lobby and cafe area from your floor. Essentially, if you were walking to your room, you could be seen from anywhere that was on your floor if they just stepped out of their room and looked around. I always was afraid I would fall over the balcony and sail down eight stories to my death, but they were high enough to a point where I wasn't too concerned for my safety. The first day or two was nice. My friends and I hung out and played cards all day. Or we watched whatever was on TV. At night, we would explore the halls of the hotel and tell each other ghost stories. It was a really fun time, even though I didn't fully understand why we were there. On the third day, though, things got strange. Fast. I woke up to the sound of screaming coming from outside my door. Now, because of the hotel's design I mentioned, sounds from the lobby would echo all the way up to the top of the building. So, when I walked outside to investigate... I immediately looked over the balcony to see what the commotion was about. I saw a girl laying on the ground. Eggs and milk splattered everywhere around her. People were rushing to help her, and I heard a couple people telling each other to call 911. It seemed like the girl was unconscious. Maybe she had passed out or something. I scanned the lobby and saw that my family and a couple of my friends were in the lobby getting breakfast all staring at the event in front of them. I decided I would rush down to meet them to find out what had happened. The elevator was on the opposite side of the floor, so I took the stairwell located right next to my room. We were on the 7th or 8th floor, so I knew I only had to take about 4 flights down. Not a big deal. I descended for a little while, looking for the number 4 on the wall, or the letter L. I passed floor number 5, 
ready to find a door to the lobby. I took about two more flights of steps before realizing that there hadn't been a door to the fourth floor, nor had there been a door to the third or the second. Now, at this point, I probably should have turned back, but I continued down because I was tired and didn't want to climb back up. There were some weird side hallways that went into pitch black areas with a bunch of piping and wiring, and though I was curious to explore, I passed them by. I quickly hit the bottom floor, a dimly lit and cold room with cinder block walls and concrete floors. In front of me was a set of double doors. I hesitated at first, but I assumed that this was just another way back to the lobby, so I opened them and entered. Behind the doors was a massive warehouse type room, probably the size of a smaller basketball stadium. The only light coming in was from the stairwell behind me, so I really wasn't able to see much. Stairs were stacked and covered in plastic wrap, tables lined the wall, and in the distance I thought I could see boxes stacked and lined against the wall as well. It was probably the storage room for the hotel. I looked around and saw an elevator in the back of the room, so I made my way towards it. I closed the door to the stairwell and began to walk in the dim light. The room was super muggy and dusty, and it seemed like nobody had been down there in a long time. As I got closer to the elevator, I noticed it was a little bigger than the elevators in the lobby and other floors. I pressed the up button, but got no response. There was a card swiper next to the button. Must have been for employees only, I thought. I turned back towards the stairwell doors, making my way past the chairs and tables along the wall. When I got to the door, I gave it a tug. Locked. Of course. This is when things started to hit me, and I realized I was stuck in the dark, dusty basement of the hotel. I didn't have a phone because my parents wouldn't let me get one until I graduated middle school, so I couldn't call anyone. Everyone likely assumed I was still asleep in the room, so I began to freak out, believing that nobody was going to look for me. I searched around the warehouse, looking for other ways out. Some areas of the place were better lit than others, so I looked around in the areas I could see first, before starting on the darker side of the room. There was one other set of doors that I found, but it happened to be locked as well. I began to cry, scared that nobody would ever find me in this basement. I swear it felt like hours, but I think only a handful of minutes passed before I heard the door creak open. It wasn't the door from the stairwell, rather, the second door I had found. A slim, middle-aged man in a lab coat came out of the doors. Now, if this was 21-year-old me seeing this man, I would be very confused as to why this guy was wearing a lab coat in a hotel, but I was only 12 or 13 at the time, so I immediately was relieved at the sight of an adult who looked smart. I approached him, tears in my eyes, and he immediately looked surprised to see me, as you would expect. What are you doing here? He yelled. I got lost on my way down to the lobby and I've been locked in here. Do you have a key? I was shaking, eager to get out of there. He didn't answer my question, and instead he said, I know a way out. Follow me. He began to walk towards the doors with the stairwell, and I followed, relieved that someone had finally come to save me. We approached the doors, and I began to reach for the handle, but he continued walking. Isn't it right here? I asked him. I will never forget the look on his face when I said that. He looked nervous, and though it was dim, I could see sweat glistening from his forehead and behind his glasses. No, this way, he said sternly. I continued to follow him, but I was now nervous myself. We had passed the doors to the stairs and were now heading towards a darker side of the basement, away from the elevators. He looked like he had no clue where he was leading me as he kept checking around him. 
almost as if he was taking in his surroundings for the first time. We turned a corner and began walking towards the boxes. A dead end. I immediately froze, realizing that something was very, very wrong. This guy had no idea where he was going, nor did he appear to work at the hotel. I said, my voice shaking, Uh, where are we going? He turned and said, This way, just follow me. I knew that there were no doors by the boxes. I had checked there first, after I found out the stairwell door was locked. I want to thank whatever God is up there for gifting me with the idea I had next. I started yelling as loud as I could. I yelled so loud I gave myself a headache. The man, irritated and plugging his ears, began yelling back at me. What are you doing? Be quiet! I continued to yell. I don't even remember how long I was yelling. Finally, the man snapped and began quickly walking towards me. I went in a full sprint towards the stairwell doors, hoping to God somehow they would be magically open. He didn't run after me. He walked sternly behind me, muttering things like, Stupid, and other kind compliments. I was about five feet from the door when somebody burst through. My savior, a hotel janitor, who had heard the screaming from the stairwell. He saw the situation, me and some random guy in a lab coat in a locked basement, and immediately told me to get behind him. The janitor asked me who the man was, and I said I had no idea, that he had come in through the door on the other side of the room, and I pointed to the door. The janitor quickly radioed in to the desk that he had found a child in the basement, and quietly he said, This man came from outside. Get security. Or something like that. The man in the lab coat started trying to argue with the janitor, claiming that he simply was looking for a bathroom. The janitor clearly wasn't buying it, and kept saying things like, Wait till security gets here and talk to them about it. I was standing beside him the whole time, trying to take in what was happening, confused out of my mind. Eventually, an employee from the front desk arrived and took me back up the steps to the lobby, where I met with my family, who surprisingly had no idea I was missing. I told them the story, crying and shaking, and they hugged me tightly, thanking the employee over and over again. I never got to thank that janitor, though. Looking back now, I have absolutely no clue what that man was doing in the basement. I don't have any information as to what happened afterwards, or who he was. I know for a fact that the incident with the girl in the lobby was unrelated. Something about low blood sugar. Not sure. I've thought about that day a lot, and the only explanation I can put together is that the door I had found in the basement led to the streets of this city, where he must have wandered in from. I have no clue what his intentions were, why he was wearing a lab coat, or why he chose to pretend to know a way out. To be frank, this could have been a huge misunderstanding of some sort, and I just chose a really bad time to get lost. But all I know for sure is if I hadn't screamed my lungs out, I might not have been here to tell this story. So last night, I was at a classmate's house working on a group project that we had for tomorrow. I live in an apartment in the town where my university is located, and my classmate lives in his parents' house, which is in the foothills, just outside of town. In order to get to the house, you have to drive along a relatively secluded and narrow two-lane road for about five or six miles. We started working on the project at about 6 p.m., and I ended up hanging around for a while after we had finished our work. So I left his house pretty late at about 11 and started down the road back towards town. I did not realize how tough it would be to navigate the road at night. There were no street lights and the road was unkempt and riddled with potholes. On top of this, 
I had no cell service, so I had to drive very slowly to make sure I didn't blow out one of my tires since I had used my spare a couple weeks back. I figured I was about three miles from the house when I rounded a tight corner and saw a pickup truck with a camper shell parked diagonally across the road. The manner in which it was parked completely impeded my path and I couldn't drive around it because there was a gully on both sides of the road. The only way for me to go at this point was backward where there was a pull-off that I could use to turn my car around. At first, I couldn't see inside the cab, but when I turned on the high beams, I saw that there was a man slouched over in the driver's seat, his head resting against the steering wheel as if he had been knocked out after a bad accident. I immediately sensed something was wrong, the way that his car had just coincidentally came to rest in a position that totally blocked the road was a big red flag. I had heard stories of people playing dead in the road as a way to lure unsuspecting people out of their cars so they could rob them, or worse. I decided screw this and elected to go back to my classmate's house and explain what was going on. I threw the car into reverse and kept my eyes darting back and forth between my rear view and the truck. I looked and saw that I was almost to the pull-off where I could turn around. When I looked back, my heart skipped about five beats. The man who had been slouched over in the driver's seat was now walking at my car at a hurried pace, while a few other men jumped out of the camper shell and started moving towards me as well. I panicked and accelerated backwards into the pull-off, which messed up the undercarriage of my car pretty bad. As I put it into drive, the guy was already at my passenger side door tugging on the handle, which, thank the Lord, was locked. I only caught a brief glimpse of him, but his face appeared to be scabbed and leathery, definitely a meth head or some sort of drug abuser. I sped away and didn't slow down at all until I reached the house, constantly checking my rear view to see if they were following. Thankfully, they didn't tail me, and when I reached the house, I explained what had happened to my classmate, and we called the cops. I was grateful that my buddy's parents were kind enough to let me stay the night. They didn't find anyone on the road matching the description, but I filed an incident report, and they told me they would be on the lookout for similar vehicles and suspicious activity. But holy crap, I'm still so shook up over it. I keep getting the same adrenaline rush I got when I saw the guy walking towards my car, whenever I think about it. One day, when I was an elementary schooler, in about third or fourth grade, I was awoken by my mom in a rush. She had overslept, and since she always woke me up in the morning, this meant that I too overslept and now there was just no way I was going to be ready for school early enough to get on the school bus. School started at 8 a.m., and my bus pickup time was 7 a.m., but it was already like 6.40 or something, and I was still in my pajamas and hadn't even had breakfast yet. So Mom decided that today we would just tell the bus driver to go on ahead, and she would take me to school, which would give me plenty of time to get ready. So I'm sitting there at the dining room table eating breakfast, still in my pajamas, and it's now about 6.50. We hear the bus pull up, about 10 minutes earlier than usual. My mom peeks her head out of the door, into the foggy morning, and waves the bus on. She closes the door and comes back inside, but the bus doesn't pull away. There's a knock at the door, and my mom opens it to find a man in a bus driver uniform. He explains that he's a substitute driver because the regular driver called in sick. He says that he knows he's a few minutes early since he wanted to get an early start on the route since he didn't know it well. My mom explains to him that she was going to take me to school that day since we woke up late. He gets visibly upset and says that he can wait a few minutes since he's already running ahead of schedule. My mom insists that no, I won't be ready to go in a few minutes, and tells him to go on ahead. 
He seemed angry about this, but turned around and got back in the bus and drove away. I returned to eating my breakfast and still don't have my school clothes on at this point. But at 7 a.m. sharp, another bus pulls up to my house. Mom thinks that it's weird and goes outside to talk to them. She comes back inside looking terrified, but doesn't really say anything about it and tells me to finish getting ready for school. At the time, I didn't know what happened, but my mom would end up telling me a few years later. When she went outside to the second bus, she found that it was being driven by my regular bus driver, and it was full of all the other kids that are usually on the route. The other bus was empty, by the way. My mom asks the driver about the substitute driver and about him calling in sick. Uh, I never called in sick. There is no substitute driver on my route. He says, The driver immediately called dispatch in a panic and told my mom to go inside and call the police, which she did without me knowing, and report this incident. There was absolutely no one doing my driver's route that day. Whoever this was, was most likely a kidnapper who had targeted me. I never heard anything about it again, not even if someone else had ended up being picked up by this mysterious fake bus driver. But chances are, had I had gotten on that bus, I would never have made it to school or back home. And if mom hadn't overslept on that specific day, I would have been on that bus. I was reading a story that reminded me of an event from over 20 years ago. In the second half of 1998, I had taken a job as a security guard at a plant that made locks. Being a kid, I usually worked one or three shifts, 4 p.m. to 12 a.m., 7.30 p.m. to 3.30 a.m., or 12 a.m. to 8 a.m. The 7.30 to 3.30 shift was for extra coverage so there was always two of us there from 7.30 to midnight. It was a routine, boring job for the most part. We did our rounds, logged anything out of the ordinary, and watched a tiny monitor displaying the CCTV feed. Things went by in an almost painfully normal manner for six months. I worked, saved, bought a car, and planned to move. By late March of 99, I served my notice and prepared to head cross-country. A new hire was brought in to fill my spot, a soft-spoken man named Calvin. As part of his training, Calvin spent time working at all hours. At night he was a shadow, working with myself and the other night guard, getting a feel for the plant's nocturnal routines. Most nights he worked with myself and Amira, a female guard who was around my age, which was 18 at the time. Calvin, who was about a decade older, was quiet and polite, though something seemed to be missing. There's a spark that genuinely nice people seem to have, and he did not possess it. Whenever he went on rounds with me, he would ask questions about the job and make small talk. I noticed that he was a little odd, laughing at odd times and changing his tone mid-sentence. At the time, I chalked it up to him just being awkward and wouldn't last. One night, near the end of his first week, he went on the rounds with Amira. When they returned to the office, I knew something was wrong. Not sure what had occurred, I waited until Calvin had gone to the restroom to ask. During their trip, everything had been normal until they reached the brass mill a portion of the plant that shut down at 6 p.m. There were usually no employees there after that time, and no lights. They were making their way to a checkpoint on a landing atop a flight of stairs when the mood shifted. She told me that she turned around, only to find that he was right on her. Startled, she backed against the grating at the end of the landing, and he leaned in towards her, his face nearly touching hers. He flirted in a low voice and, when she mentioned his wedding band, he said it would be over soon. From then on, I did the rounds, 
taking Calvin with me each time. The night ended without further incident, and I left a note for our supervisor detailing what had occurred. The next night came and went with no Calvin. I did the rounds while Amira stayed in the locked office. Same thing the night after. Then, on my second to last shift, I come in and find her freaking out. She found out why Calvin hadn't been at work. He had been arrested for murdering his wife. That night and the next, Amira called the jail just to make sure that they were still holding him. Based on the time frame, he had killed his wife months before he started the job. I was watching my daughter's kids while she and her husband went out of town. They have a teenage daughter, let's call her Alyssa. At like 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm woken up by a weird rustling sound and look out the window and see movement. I saw a boy emerge from the bushes on the side of the house. I saw a bike tossed on the lawn that definitely wasn't ours. My first thought was that it was a burglar casing houses, but since he looked young and came through on a bike, I figured scaring him straight would be enough for him to decide to head home. Didn't want to ruin a teenager's life by calling the cops straight away, so I went out on the porch, flipped the lights on, and said, Can I help you? In my classroom voice. The guy looked surprised, but not nervous. He was wearing a Letterman-style jacket, but once I got a clear view of him in the streetlights, he seemed much older than my granddaughter, and more wiry than athletic. He walked up closer to the house and said, Yeah, I'm looking for Alyssa. I gave him a disapproving glare, hoping that he would realize that he came looking for a girl late at night, and a grumpy old person answered, and that it's time to split. I'm thinking what must have happened is Alyssa knew her parents were going to be out of town, and maybe before she knew I would be staying over, told a secret older boyfriend to come over. It was late, and I was alone with several kids, so I didn't want him coming any closer to the house. I also thought it was weird that he came so late, and wanted to be sure Alyssa actually wanted to talk to him. So I said, I'm sorry, who? And he said, Alyssa, you know... This is her house. And then I said back, You wait right there. He started to walk up and I felt a sick burning in my gut. Instinct kicked in. I yelled, No, stop. I said, wait there. Then, readjusted and said, You stay right there. This is private property. Don't take another step. Just wait there. So I go in, and Alyssa is asleep just one room over from where the rustling first occurred, and I wake her up and say something to the effect of, I don't know what the big idea was to have friends over this time of night, but you tell them to go home. She has no clue what I'm talking about. I say, there's a guy outside asking for you. Confused, she gets up and goes to the window. She sees him and goes white as a sheet. He asked for me? Yeah? By name? Yes. Call the police. I've never seen him in my life. I called 911 immediately. But as I was on the phone with them, Alyssa started tugging at my arm. He's coming up to the door. I had younger kids in the house to think about, so I kept the door latched and pulled it just open enough and yelled. I asked my husband, and none of us know in Alyssa, leave my property or I'm calling 911. He got angry and started yelling for her to come out. Thankfully, the police came pretty quickly, and when he heard the sirens, he grabbed the bike and ran off. I watched where he was running, and he jumped into the passenger side of a car without headlights or front plates, and sped off. The police followed in the same direction once they arrived, but they didn't find him. 
They advised us to take her social media details offline if she was sure she didn't know this person and said they had a couple similar reports recently and were looking into it. I got a heavy duty lock and she slept in my room for the remainder of my visit. I will try to avoid it as much as possible, but the story might occasionally jump around because of so much to unpack. So I'm sorry in advance if anything is confusing. My name is Lily. I'm a 20-year-old woman who lives with my boyfriend Ben and our three cats. We live in a two-bedroom, two-bath apartment on the third floor, right next to the stairs, and can very easily hear anyone walking up or entering the apartments around us. Our room is right beside the front door, and the window looks out into the wooden stairs and the deck area. A little context. A little less than a year ago, I had a stalker. I met him on a popular BDSM site and made it very clear to him from the beginning that I wasn't interested in anything serious, strictly a friends with benefits type of relationship. He was a little odd and admitted to me that he had autism, but I didn't care. I started distancing myself from him when he began talking about his severe mental illness, specifically his predisposition to schizophrenia. I told him he needed to seek medical attention if he thought something was wrong and tried supporting him. I tried backing away completely when he admitted to me that he had dreams of murdering me. I immediately cut contact with him, but made sure to record calls and voicemails. I had two jobs at the time, retail and food. When talking to my retail co-workers about him, many knew him and said this behavior was not new. Ben and I had just began seeing each other at this point, but he as well as my parents strongly encouraged that I file for a restraining order. I told him I would think it over, but it was solidified when he showed up to my place of work just to get food one day. I hid in the back of the restaurant and told my shift leader I couldn't go up there again until he was gone. I could tell he was skeptical, but said it was fine as long as I stayed busy in the back. I called Ben while back there to inform him of what was going on, and after hanging up, resumed my job. Ben showed up minutes after and made it very clear to my stalker that I didn't want to see him again, but he did not threaten the man. My boss later told me that while making my stalker's meal, he looked two co-workers in the eyes and said, I know Lily is in the back, hiding from me. My uncle is a retired lawyer, and therefore helped me take proper action against him. My stalker's lawyer and my uncle worked together frequently before my uncle retired, and struck a deal with my attorney and uncle that he would put the fear of God in him. After all this, I have yet to see him again. Returning to the original story, Ben and I are both night owls and also pretty antisocial. It was around 11.30 p.m., and Ben and I were chatting quietly with the lights off in our room. There was a natural lull in our conversation when we were both on our phones, and there was a knock at the door. We both froze instantly and stayed silent. There were a few more seconds of silence, and then the knock repeated. This pattern continued for about five minutes before I started freaking out silently to Ben beside me. Ben and I quietly walked out of our room and to the door, looking out the peephole, and saw no one. Still freaking out, we walked to the kitchen and both grabbed steak knives to give ourselves some semblance of feeling safe. When attempting to go back to our room, the knock happened twice more and Ben ordered me back to the bedroom. I hid just out of sight in case things got ugly and needed to surprise attack whoever this was. He looked out the peephole again and before I could whisper, asking if he saw anyone, he flung the door open and walked onto the balcony I hissed at him to get back inside, and he did just that, before locking the door again. He said no one was there, 
and proceeded to lock us and the cats in the room for the night. We really hope it was a case of someone having the wrong apartment. When telling my parents, they were pissed that I did not call the police, saying it very well could have been an attempted burglary. Small side note, my nine-year-old sister lives with our grandmother in the same complex, but different apartment. I pushed and asked if she had attempted pranking us, ready to tear her a new one about how she could have been hurt. She very heavily insisted that she didn't. I will probably never find out who it was that night, but I will give you one guess. This is something that was super traumatic for me, but it was never discussed again in my household. I was talking with my mom about it the other night, and she still didn't say much. Thought I would share my thoughts with you all. When I was 13, I got a Dell desktop for school. The internet was fairly new for me back in 2003. AOL and MySpace. Yahoo Messenger. AOL chat rooms. You get it. AOL chat rooms was where I went. I was a shy, overweight kid back then. Still shy to this day. But online. Online, I could be anyone. I could say anything. It was amazing. I discovered so many things when I got the internet. If I could be anyone, so could someone else. Thus how I met one 27-year-old man. One night I logged on. The AOL dial-up sound still makes me feel uneasy. I was sitting in my cold, dark kitchen. The computer was here, so I could be monitored. It was just me and my mom, though, and she was always working, so no one ever really monitored me. Plus, she had no idea how to use a computer, so I got away with a lot. I was bored, so I hopped into an AOL chat room. I was lurking around for a bit, Typing 15 forward slash female here. I was really 13, but I told people I was 15, and it made me feel more mature. Private message incoming. Hey, my name is Rob. Where are you from? And that's how it started. I told him where I was from, that I was in high school, which wasn't a lie. My school was from 7th to 12th grade. You? 19-year-old male, New York. Oh man, was it cool to be talking to an older guy. And boy, was he cute. Honestly, I don't really remember much. Maybe I blanked it out. Maybe my memory is just shot. I do remember emails back and forth. The occasional phone call. I remember finding out he was talking to another girl, and I wanted to break things off. But he begged and pleaded until I caved. Then, the let's meet. I was nervous. He had never asked for a picture. He never really asked for much from me. Just the emails back and forth. A phone call a day. But somehow, he made me feel safe. Made me feel wanted. He cared for me. He drove from New York to West Virginia one day. My mom worked right beside my house, so we parked a quarter mile away and took the back alley to enter my house. My friend was with me when he showed up, but was scared when she seen him and ran out the back door. I maybe should have taken a hint from that, but just stood on the back porch with my head down. Was given a hug as he led me inside. Not five minutes after being there, sitting on the couch did he move things further, then further, even into my bedroom. I won't get into the details on what happened next. I assume most can guess. After, he left. With instructions to get in his car after I get off the school bus and we will go on a date. I had no idea where he was staying. I lived extremely far in the country, an hour's drive from the closest hotel. The next day I get ready for school, ride the bus for the 45 minute drive, and as soon as I hop off in the school parking lot, I get directly into his car. No one noticed. No one said anything. We drove around, 
and never went on a date. He just finds some different places to park so that he can use me. I notice a photo of another young girl, 15 or 16, in the visor of his car. I question him. Believe when he tells me that it's his cousin. Believe when I question why his hairline is receding so much. I believe him when he tells me I can't see his driver's license because he left it in the hotel. I believed him when he said he loved me. I get dropped back off at school, super sad that he was going back home, with promises he will call. Again, everything feels very fuzzy. I can't remember many emotions from this time. I do remember that a few days later my mom says she found out that I skipped school with a man, that I was never to see him again, and that was that. I do remember sending an email. I do remember a late night phone call. I do remember saying, I wish I could just live with you. I remember him suggesting to come get me. I remember saying, okay. Days later, by the time he made the drive again, I was feeling iffy about leaving my mom. I loved her after all. I didn't think things through. I didn't put much thought into anything really. Packed a few clothes in a suitcase. Forgot all my underwear. And that is one of my sharpest memories. I felt bad that he drove eight hours to get me. So I left in the middle of the night. Got in the car with him and his cousin. He got in the back seat with me. And proceeded to do things to me while his cousin drove. Then he got back in the front seat. This happened a few times between my home and his. The drive took forever. I had nothing to drink, was offered nothing when they got something. They stopped to take a nap at a rest stop, and I attempted to collect call my mom, which was disabled on our phone. I dug around for some change to get something to drink, but couldn't afford anything in the convenience store, so I drank out of the truck stop sink. Hours later, we park a block away from his house while he runs to get something. I am sitting in the back seat, waking from a nap, when around eight or so, men and women in black suits surround the car, screaming for us to get out with our hands up. My first thought, oh crap, first ten minutes in New York and I am already being robbed. I am terrified. I get out and a man pulls me over to the curb while the other officers force his cousin onto the ground. All the while they are asking my name and age, telling me to tell his cousin my age. I am put in the back of an unmarked car, driven to the New York Police Department, past reporters, cameras, news trucks, snuck into the back of the station, where I see Rob in handcuffs for the first time. And for me, 14 and in love, this was devastating. I am taken into the room and questioned for hours. I am then taken to the hospital, then a hotel where a nice woman brings me Taco Bell and stays with me as I fall asleep. The next day, two FBI officers escort me home on a plane, where I get off and where I am greeted by police officers, my mother, and a horde of news reporters. I later found out that when my mom reported me missing, the police didn't want to do much. They didn't even take the picture of me. She had his license plate number. She remembered seeing his car parked on the road that first meeting. She took note since it was an out-of-state car. Thanks to her being vigilant, I do find that this is the only reason why I am alive today. The police said they would look into it, but that wasn't enough for my mom. She contacted a family friend who in turn contacted the governor of West Virginia, who in turn made the police look further into it. After they ran the license number, looked into the man, found out who he was, that was when they issued an Amber Alert, noting that I was in extreme danger. My cousin told my mom that he looked at Rob's rap sheet, and it was a mile long, but wouldn't tell my mother what was on it, for fear of scaring her more. I never went to court. I never went to any hearings. 
but I did fall into a horrible depression. My friend's parents wouldn't let them hang out with me. People spray-painted slut on my locker at school. I had no friends, but most of all, I thought a man was in prison for loving me. When I learned he got sentenced to ten years in prison, I became deeply troubled. I was in and out of the mental hospital for self-harm for years. On a slew of depression medication, psychiatrists never talked to me about anything. I had to process it all myself. My teenage years were better, though. I transferred schools, made best friends, graduated. But still in the back of my mind, I felt that I was the reason a man lost ten years of his life. Until I was told that he was let out of prison. A couple of years after he was out, I contacted him on Facebook. At the time, I was around 24 or 25. He told me that if I ever contacted him again, he would kill both me and my mother, that he still knows where I live. I had no idea what he was planning to do with me. Some good things happened because of my kidnapping. Schools all over my state started internet safety education classes. Kids were taught safety. Parents were taught how to keep kids safe. No other girls were taken by this man. So. To the man who ruined so many years of my life, I am 29 now. I am happy, healthy, and I have zero remorse that you were in prison for so many years. Thank mm-hmm. you.